I was very struck by Dr. Chowdhury's paper this morning for a number of reasons, personal reasons, but also the statement that he made about um, the stage of the illness that we do investigations in. And I think that what I'm about to say uh, has a relevance for that because the longer you're ill with this condition, the more vascular aspects there are and the possibility, in fact, of developing what I would call a cardiovascular event downstream. And many of our patients uh, in the east of Scotland certainly are ill for between seven and tw 20 years. I'm not aware of many new patients in our region, and this is an epidemiological uh, phenomena rather than uh, my own kind of work, but there does seem to be um, a shortage of patients in the, in the last five or six years of, of new patients. And, um, it's difficult for us to get patients to the centre to carry out experiments at, at early stages of the condition, which is what I'm trying to say here. Um, and I'm speaking today with this hat on here, this uh, vascular hat on today. Um, why vascular? Well, of course, I've spent my life in vascular biology, so that's a good enough reason. But there are uh, vascular features of this illness. And last night I just was reading Byron's little book, and he says here, one of the reasons I believe that pain syndromes in ME are due to a pathological vascular pathology. He's talking about the reaction to persantin, um, which is a vasodilator, which I have no experience with in ME patients. But uh, I do agree with what he says here, that there is a lot of vascular physiology in many of the symptoms, particularly post-exertional symptoms. And I put in this paper that, that I had in one of my, my, my PowerPoint talks last night. And it's from 2006, December, European Journal of Pain. It's, it's in fibromyalgia, but this is a very interesting study uh, using um, a contrast medium. Uh, they've injected some dissolvable um, uh, spheres here in, into the muscle, in fact, the gastrocnemius, and the muscle's been uh, severely exercised. And what you see is that, if you can understand that, in a normal person, there's a very high degree of flow, of course, the muscle at rest has a very low blood flow, about three mils per 100 grams per minute, and, and at exercise it might be 300. So there's a, a huge increase in, in, in blood flow, uh, usually uh, via arteriolar dilatation. And you can see in this fibromyalgia patient that there's no flow, which is an extraordinary situation, and that is going to give rise to pain. It's not unlike you, the experience you would see in a, in a vascular patient uh, with claudication. Uh, and uh, the, the reasons for that are interesting, and maybe Marty is right, that this is a, a local arterial vasoconstriction, and I'll speak about that in a minute. Uh, uh, maybe involving NO, uh, um, or at least NO being scavenged by uh, free radicals, and uh, if there's less NO, the, vessel, the vessels collapse. And I very much got involved, or re-involved, or back into uh, the research in this field with this paper in 1995, published in The Lancet, I found it a really extraordinary paper. And uh, you can see here that uh, these are patients who had a tilt test. And they are seven children, in fact, ages 11 to 16. Uh, one male, five female patients, blood pressure at rest, blood pressure and tilt. I mean, these are some extraordinary blood pressures here. You know, you're not going to feel well with a BP of 37 over 24. Um, and the test itself, the tilt, was very severe. It was 100, 100 uh, 90 degrees, sorry, and we wouldn't use that any longer. Uh, in fact, that, this test, uh, this tilt test, is actually could be very symptom-producing in, in many patients, and 75 degrees is enough. Uh, and a recent paper, in fact, 2007, shows autonomic changes in 25% of tilt. Um, but the point about it is that uh, if you want to make an ME patient ill, and I think that, uh, that we should recognize this, you don't have to exercise them. You just got to stand up against the wall for 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and, and patients will be sick. There's no questions about that. And that is vascular. In my view, that is a vascular phenomenon. Uh, standing patients just still against the wall without exercise. And it is stress. And it's not what uh, psychiatrists call postural hypertension, like you'd get in a diabetic patient with uh, autonomic neuropathy or, or a Parkinson's patient or in an old person. In fact, the blood pressure doesn't fall in adults at all. I published this in 2005. It's a small part of a larger paper on oxidation. 
And you can see that, in fact, the blood pressure hasn't fallen, uh, systolic, diastolic, and in fact, not in any individual either, bar, bar one patient here who has a mean arterial pressure fall of about 18 millimeters of mercury, which, strictly speaking, is naturally postural either. Um, so the blood pressure doesn't fall uh, in the first uh, three, four, even five minutes. And, but they do have a tachycardia, which is why it's called POTS, uh, the change in, blood pre change in heart rate in the patients on tilt as against the controls here. And it's a very significant tachycardia, uh, which is why it's called uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, that many, if not most, of these patients have. And uh, I'm struck as well by uh, Julian Stewart's work in New York. He's published an awful lot of papers, uh, on, on mainly on POTS, but he has actually looked at CFSME patients as well. And here he's measured uh, peripheral blood flow here. This is fairly old-fashioned uh, string gaze plasmograph, but it does the business of measuring uh, uh, leg volume changes and therefore uh, blood flow changes in, in the lower limb. And what you see is fairly obvious, that is that when a healthy person stands up, that the blood flow to the limbs uh, goes down. There's a, uh, both a, a bare receptor central component and also a local vasoconstriction here. And uh, the reason for that is very obvious. If it didn't happen, we'd all fall over. But if you look at his, what he calls low flow POTS, and what he means by that are patients with MECFS-like uh, syndromes that have very low blood flow. And you see, in fact, that at rest, they're actually constricted and that the blood flow goes up. So this is a very clear uh, demonstration of some form of abnormality whether that's central, only central, or whether there's a peripheral mechanism is open to question, and it's something I've been very much involved in trying to resolve, and I quite honestly thought it'd be very easy. It, it took me no more than a year or two, and seven years later, we're still not there. Sometimes this is obvious, by the way, but as Abhijit said, it gets more obvious as the patients get uh, chronically ill. The longer you're ill, the more you see these phenomena. Sometimes it's really very obvious. I don't know what that looks like here, but it's, can be a model blue the longer you hold these patients up. And no, we don't understand it, uh, and I don't have time to go over the biology here, but uh, the venous compliance, in fact, is very odd. In fact, uh, there's less venous compliance than there in the CFS patients, i.e. a lower distension of the venous uh, circuitry than you would expect. Venous emptying. I'm not so sure about uh, filtration and edema in these patients, but four and five uh, increased arterial vasoconstriction, which is odd when you think that the legs look red. Uh, you would think, well, hang on a minute, they must be dilated. Well, they aren't. And there's a corollary here to uh, another disease called uh, EM, in fact, erythromelalgia, because they have the same phenomenon. Uh, and, and, and it facilitates actually chronic pain in these patients. And they have arterial vasoconstriction, but the legs are red on, on being upright. Uh, pallor on elevation, rubber on dependency, redness on, on dependency. Uh, I've been looking at that last pathway there, nitric oxide pathway, which Marty's talked about this morning. But I'm going to talk about some measurements here uh, rather than uh, hypotheses. Uh, I think it's important that we have some data uh, in this field. And briefly, really, um, nitric oxide is what we would call an endothelial independent dilator. And the reason for that is that if we remove the endothelium, and we can do that in vitro very easily, and we add nitric oxide, the blood vessel still dilates. If you add a endothelium in the, uh, sorry, dependent dilator, acetylcholine is a major one, substance P, uh, bradykinin, and there are other uh, dilators here of this, this, this order. If you, add, if you take off the endothelium and add one of these, it won't dilate. And so it's what is called an endothelium dependent. And the biology is relatively simple. And I, we see here what happens here with acetylcholine activates uh, NOS via IP3 and production of nitric oxide, cyclic GMP, not AMP, via uh, guanylase cyclase here. So the blood vessel dilates in a very specific way, the production of endothelial nitric oxide, activation of ENOS within the endothelial cell. And that's just a simple way of adding it. If you add ast acetylcholine, which of course, not many people realize that acetylcholine is a major uh, a nitrodilator, we would call it. It's, people recognize it as a neurotransmitter in both the muscle and in the brain. But it's also a very potent uh, vasodilator in, in all blood vessels, oddly. I'm talking about uh, postcapillary veins, microcirculation, heart, liver, kidney, all organs. It's a dilator, a major dilator. We can uh, look at this by various techniques. 
Nowadays, we use uh, flow-mediated dilatation. This is an older way that we've been using for many years. And basically, what we've done here is a cumulative dose of acetylcholine. Um, and we can see that when we add the first dose, we then add a second dose on top of this. And this is a current here of 1 millicoulomb, 2 millicoulomb, 4, 8. What we're doing, in fact, is simply um, adding a solution of acetylcholine hydrochloride uh, to the skin, passing a current over it, and separating acetylcholine from the hydrochloride with a positive charge and driving it to the skin. So it's a non-invasive way of, of uh, examining uh, skin microcirculation. Well, we have, as well, done it with intra-arterial infusions, and uh, I'll speak about, about that later. And just to summarize, I don't want to go into too much detail about this particular pathway, but that if you, uh, if you, you can see here that if you add acetylcholine in the first dose, it's, it's not increased the blood flow here, but by the second dose it is. Now, the reason that that is actually very odd, there are very, very few conditions that have that type of sensitivity. I would say all of the conditions that we look at in our hospital, in our department, I'm talking about the diabetes, heart disease, stroke, vascular diseases in general, lipid disorders, all of them have blunting. All of them have blunting. There are a couple of diseases, uh, Fabry's disease, for example, which is an inherited lipid disorder. And these patients die of stroke, oddly enough, and they have acetylcholine sensitivity. And uh, sickle cell anemia is another one. They have acetylcholine sensitivity. But it is unusual, very, very unusual. You can create the very same effect, oddly, by using an organophosphate. And this is an experiment that's independent of me, carried out in Southampton by Geraldine Clough, published in J Physiol, Pi Physiol 2004. What she's done here is a um, very similar experiment to what I would do. She's added acetylcholine here. And you see that there's a huge flare of blood flow. And by 20 minutes, it's resolved. And it's gone by 30 minutes. But when she pre-treats the skin with malathion, which is um, uh, a hair, a hair lice shampoo, uh, I, th I think it's I think it's used in hair lice shampoo. And when you when you pre-treat it and drive that through with ionophoresis, and on top of that you do the experiment, what you see is that there is a significant flare, and it's maintained, and that's what happens in chronic fatigue syndrome patients. Actually, that when you add the first dose, it doesn't. Uh, the blood flow doesn't increase any more than control. By the time you add the second dose, you're adding it on top of something that's that continued to be dilated, just like that. We added a second dose there, we would get an increase in blood flow. So that's, that's what we're looking at. And it is uh, very odd that, that, that this phenomena can be, can be um, cloned in a way with malathion. Now, I do apologize for that, I, and, but I just wanted to show you that we, I've spent quite a lot of time, certainly in the last two years, with my colleagues trying to unravel uh, what that is. Of course, that previous slide would suggest that it might be the uh, muscarinic receptor here, but there's a lot of pathways in there uh, to unpick, and we have carried out an experiment uh, to unravel that, uh, looking at this uh, nitric oxide pathway here, one, two, this prostacyclin pathway, because there is a second receptor there for acetylcholine. This one is an M3 GQ11 receptor, but there's also an M2 uh, GI receptor, which activates uh, prostacyclin. And so we thought, well, wait a minute, maybe this is blunted, maybe that's excited. But unfortunately, there are two others here, and there's this, what we now call EDHF, endothelial-derived hyperpolarizing factor is a major component in disease states. That when NO is blunted, EDHF upregulates. And finally, as Marty talked about today, the idea that you might have endothelial oxidation and that activates a potassium channel. And that experiment, in fact, is uh, completed. We finished that. I'm not going to talk about the data today because it's very complex. Uh, you see that it involved um, an intra-arterial infusion of blocking NO uh, with uh, L-monomethyl uh, arginine, a blocking um, EDHF with sulfazenazole. So these are four visits to the department, each with an intra-arterial infusion. So it's not something that we've uh, done lightly. We've had difficulty getting ethical permission to do that. 
uh, but it's been completed. But the reason that I wanted to discuss it, uh, if I have time, but I'm going to go a bit quicker, is that we, eight of these patients that we chose were very sensitive. And we, we chose them because they were sensitive, because we wanted to, to unpick the sensitivity. And you can see that, that this is absolutely clear, they're sensitive. But lo and behold, five years later, they're blunted. And this is the 2006-07 experiment here. You see that rather than being on top, let me just get both these together. Here you see that these eight patients are incredibly sensitive to acetylcholine, and they're blunted. Now that is, uh, in five years, that's a huge shift. And it begs a question uh, as to what on earth is going on. And it, it probably um, fits in well with what Abhijit was saying, that in time, over time, things get worse here. And other biological mechanisms, particularly oxidation inflammation, are impacting on this system. And it's the, the briefly here, you see that I, we have actually published the fact that HDL is low. Cholesterol is normal in our patients, generally speaking. Much of the LDL is oxidized. These nasty vasoconstricting isoprostines are significantly raised. And there's a degree in our own patients, these are our own measurements, these are published measurements, uh, the CRP is raised. I'll, I'll speak about that in a minute briefly. And the transforming growth factor beta one is raised. So it's a, a mildly pro-inflammatory, significantly pro-oxidant condition. And that, of course, is going to um, add to this vascular component. And finally, and most interestingly, this paper really struck me, and it hasn't received any attention at all in the, in the CFS literature. And this is a, a, a problem with CFS papers in general, that they just get buried, that if no one's interested, they're not picked up. This was a paper in pediatrics, uh, 2005. Is it a connective tissue disorder? No, it isn't. Well, at least they didn't find any. But they made this remarkable statement that there's a wholly unexpected finding of stiffer arteries in 35 adolescents aged 12 to 18, warranting additional investigation. Now, um, the degree of stiffness is uh, very significant and a lot more stiff, in fact, than you would find in diabetic children who have a reason for stiffness. And they weren't bedbound patients. They weren't that deconditioned. So that is a truly extraordinary phenomena in young patients. And we decided to look at it in adults and to compare it with other markers. Uh, quickly here, we're talking about one index. There are several indices here. We're talking about the augmentation, but it's corrected for the heart rate. And you'll see why in a minute. Um, these patients are, these adult patients have a high BMI. The, this is central aortic pressure. This is not uh, auscultation. Um, they're not hypertensive in the clinical sense of the word, but you see the pressure is higher, and the heart rate is higher uh, by five beats a minute. So we've corrected that because the higher the heart rate, the stiffer the tubes, so we have to correct for it. And what you see simply is normal cholesterol, again, decreased HDL, increased oxidized LDL, increased isoprostines by 45%, and the CRP, the HSCRP, that's an ELISA CRP, is raised by about threefold. So they're not inflammatory in, the, in, in, in terms of a, a rheumatoid patient, but they are inflammatory in the way a rheumatoid patient might be if they were treated with steroid and their inflammation was brought down. It comes down to about four. And that, um, in these patients, in these arthritis patients, um, gives a cardiovascular risk, in fact, of, of about nine times. And the augmentation is up by 50%, and that is a very significant degree of stiffness in patients in the age of 20, 22 to 55. And if we look at this in a multiple regression, uh, put in age, put in the length of time they've been ill, their, ba their body mass index, their, their gender, blood pressure, <coughs> oxidation. Surprisingly for me, because I thought the uh, isoprostines would be the uh, answer, but in fact, it's the inflammation that dominates the picture, that the more HSCRP you have, the higher the inflammation, the more the stiffness. So that's, this is a, this is a kind of pro-inflammatory stiffness. What causes it? Well, it isn't any of the normal things. It isn't age. I, the kids have got it. It isn't diabetes. It isn't hypertension. It isn't any of these factors. Um, it might be a direct effect of the inflammation. That is true. And my own view is that it's driven by something that Kenny knows a lot about, which is neutrophil elastase, and the breakdown of uh, elastin. Uh, uh, these are called elastin degradation products. So we haven't measured elastase, unfortunately, nor the, ET, the EDP, and I think it's something that we should do.
finally, uh, if I have time, just give two slides. Thank you, and I, I'm finished. I want to go back to what, what Peter said, because in 2007, in the American Journal of Medicine, he said, in our studies of 200 patients, quiet, upright posture has been a strong and consistent stressor in 95% of patients. And I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I don't know how many patients are here who feel that's correct, that if you stand up, you get ill. And in fact, it's probably worse than walking, because at least by walking, you activate the, uh, the venous pump, the venous return. Uh, but just standing quietly, uh, w without using tilt tests, is enough to provoke symptoms. And even when it's not accompanied by changes, and what he means by that is that you don't have to see flushing. You don't have to see the, le the, the, the legs going red. That is a phenomenon which develops over time. It's typically associated with uh, exacerbation of, of symptoms. And, and this is a very serious stress for a lot of patients just standing up, a very serious stress indeed. And whether it's uh, primary or secondary is a good question. And of course, there are uh, autonomic uh, considerations uh, involved here as well. The evidence suggests that it plays an important role in the phenomenology of the illness. And symptomatically, of course, uh, that, that rings a bell. And that finally he says, we should investigate it. Uh, we should try to unravel it, whether in fact it's, as Marty says, um, a purely uh, NO pathway but in my view, there, there, there are peripheral mechanisms here in, involved here, probably involving the NO uh, arteriolar constriction pathway. 